So Justin, thank you very much for today. It's, it's great to have you on. And I think it's going to be really good for people to understand a different aspect of the technology industry, right? So not necessarily being a deep dive techie and going into what widget does what kind of scenario, but understanding there is there is less technical roles in the industry that people can come into and still get a, an area of a career within IT. Um, so it'd be great if you could just introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are. Cool, thanks, Carl. And uh, you know, thank, thank you for having me on. Um, so I'm Justin Thorogood. Uh, I work for Citrix and I look after our networking channel for Northern Europe. And uh, my, my job, put very simply, is to ensure that our partners really understand you know, what it is that we're taking to market, making sure that our technology rolls into your propositions because you don't necessarily sell vendor technology. You're selling business outcomes, use cases, and it's my job to make sure that we effectively translate that you know, technical story into something that's very viable and hopefully something that resonates well with your customers. Yeah, perfect. And what, just kind of going on that, so what kind of accreditations and things have you got, if oh, any? Yeah, <laughs> so, um, I mean, obviously, uh, we'll, we'll talk, talk a little bit about the journey in a bit, but I think for me, in terms of actual accreditations, not very many, if I'm quite honest with you. So uh, I started life out as a techie, so I've, I've slowly moved, you know, moved and meandered my way in. Uh, to the role I'm in now, you know, through through several jumps. But uh, in terms of qualifications, it's the school of life. Yeah, fantastic. So on that then, your career, your journey, how it started out. So give, give us an intro into that. Where, where did you start and how have you got to where you are today? So uh, I think my job, uh, you know, once we, we kind of left university, you know, I, I, studied, um, I studied business systems computing. So, you know, I looked at systems analysis and design, presentation skills, coding. Um, you know, I was always a, a closet techie. I really enjoyed technology as a whole. And uh, I kind of left university, you know, more like many of us do, wondering what, the, you know, what next, what the hell do I do? I kind of planned up until that point. And then there's like, you know, there's pressure from the family to say, you know, right, you've got to get a job now, you know, you know, and I kind of fell into accountancy, which I'll be honest with you, I absolutely hated. <laughs> it was, it was dreadful. Um, I, I, and I, and I did that for a while. Um, and as I said, I kind of meandered my way around very, you know, various jobs. And I think, I think for me, it was a case of actually having people more senior than me kind of guiding and helping, uh, you know, saying, you know, you've got some great skills here. We think you'd be better in this particular area. And I think, you know, the light bulb moment, I think for me was that, uh, you know, I had, I started out in IT support, you know, answering the phone, fixing people's noddy windows problems um i found that i just had a knack for problem solving and uh i, I worked my way up i did my my uh my mcse uh with microsoft i gained my uh cisco accreditations in network architecture and network design and uh that kind of led me down a path where i became very much a, you know became a pre-sales individual um you know i really enjoyed talking to customers i under, you know understanding what their problems were uh, trying to articulate a solution which I felt was a was a was a good fit, and so you know I, I ended up working you know in for a similar company that you work for now, Kyle, um, working in the city. Uh, I work for some very large finance and legal firms, and of course you know each vertical has its own unique challenges, legislation, uh, things that they want to achieve. Um, but I think I was working at a time you know before the finance you know the financial meltdown where you know, there, was, there was budgets to be spent. And I think uh, customers wanted you to help them spend that money. And so if you had something with you know, a reasonable ROI, you had a, you know, you had a good fighting chance of getting, uh, you know, getting that business closed. Um, and I found that, uh, you know, that my career, I guess, progressed naturally from that point. Fantastic. And what, what made you take the move from, from reseller world to, to vendor space? wasn't a natural jump, if I'm honest with you. Um, I think for me, um, I had a little dibble dabble. I, I was, as I said, I took I took an initial jump. I worked uh, I worked for a call center company. Um, we we I say call center is call center software and CTI. Um, that was a job that kind of took me around the world. Uh, I worked, it was a small enterprising company working alongside Cisco, and you know we were exploding. So I got to spend three years in America. Uh, starting up a channel and I think that was really my first taste of what channel was really about um, I've really enjoyed it I enjoyed kind of building something from nothing you know building plans um, you know articulating what you know what enablement needs to be kind of 
naturally taking our technology and pushing it into the into the in, into that partner's proposition. And um, as I said, that that took me into becoming you know working for a channel partner. I've really really enjoyed that. Um, after the financial you know crisis, unfortunately, I found myself on the receiving end of a P45. Uh, the company itself actually closed. Uh, I worked for an organisation called Affinity that were owned by KCOM, and uh, the business actually folded. So I found myself kind of jumping around a little bit. I worked for a managed services provider for a while. I then went, ended up working for a, a niche a niche partner. You know that were glorified lines and minutes and they were looking to mature their, their portfolio. You know, I came with my relationships with some, you know, top tier vendors uh, and I managed to get us a seat at the table. Um, but I'll be honest with you, I found that, I did find that a real struggle working for, you know, for a, a, that small company. You know, there were some, dare I say, questionable practices, morally questionable deals that were happening and a lot of profit being made. And I think I really struggled with that personally. Um, and I actually took a break. Um, I, 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 we talk about you know what is it that kind of pushes you to the edge and I think for me it was it was the fact that I just couldn't I couldn't stand in that room with a customer trying to articulate a story that I didn't truly believe in because I knew it was about profit and it wasn't about uh, delivering true business outcome for that customer and I think at that point I just I had to take a break um, I, I took a break I ran I thought to myself you know what I I can do some of this stuff myself. I started my own consultancy for six months, just really just to kind of keep the wheels turning. You know, I had some financial, in my own financial backing, I'd, I'd put scrub money away. I thought I'd give it a try for a while, see, see what it would be like working, you know, me being the boss, you know, mm -hmm. judge, jury and executioner. And it was a tough lesson. You know, it was a really tough lesson. I've got nothing but respect for people that, that, that go out on their own and start their own business. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and I think I saw the error of my ways to a certain degree. I was keeping the wheels turning, but certainly wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't making money. And the opportunity with Citrix came along. And uh, I think the, the, the appeal for me was that uh, it was, they were hiring it for a networking role within Channel. So they were, what they were looking for was kind of like a, a pink elephant. And I just happened to be that kind of someone with a technical background that understood channel, that had worked in a sales role, that had carried quota. Uh, and uh, it just so happened, you know, right place, right time. And I did have an axe to grind with, uh, with one of Citrix's competitors specifically. Um, I had, you know, I had dealt with them in the past and uh, unfortunately business that we'd worked on got passed to other partners, which yeah. you've been there and done that, Kyle, you yeah. know how that feels. Um, and uh, I didn't know Citrix as a networking vendor, if I'm honest with you. I, I worked, you know, for a long time in the industry selling, you know, Cisco, Nortel, Avaya, and on the security side, you know, Checkpoint um, and Fortinet and, and Riverbed and others, but Citrix had never factored. So I kind of saw that as an interesting challenge to kind of get Citrix put on the map. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And what would you say the most memorable moment of your career is today? Um, I think it was actually my during my first year at Citrix. So um, you know, it was a it, it it was a baptism of fire to a certain degree. You know, you're you're in a partner asking for an unreasonable amount of time. You've only done a small amount of revenue, but you're asking, you know, to, for growth. And then the first thing, the question that you get asked is, well, how are you going to help us develop that new business? And uh, you know, I had to come up with some plans pretty quick. Um, and I, it was the first. I think it was the first uh, first summit that I actually didn't attend. So Citrix Summit is our annual event. Um, it was a time where Citrix wasn't doing particularly well. I'd only been there just over a year. I didn't get to go and I actually won an Outstanding Achievement Award. So I was getting a barrage of texts at 5.30 in the morning from some uh, probably, you know, well-oiled uh, Citrites saying congratulations. And I'm thinking, what for? What have I done? Um, so that was quite satisfying. I'd like to have been there to accept the award in person, but, um, you know, I've, uh, I, I have enjoyed, you know, a lot of success since then. But I think for me, in my Citrix life, the other memorable moments have actually been the things not related to work. So uh, Citrix does a lot of work in the community. Um, we have something called the Global Day of Impact, and it's an opportunity for us to give up our time for a day and spend it with a charity doing a, a certain activity. And last year it was with uh, a local community trust called the Leonard Cheshire, and I am the world's worst painter. Uh, I did it with myself and my boss, Mark, and a couple of our SCs, and we painted their front room and the reason it was so memorable was because when we finished it, first of all, there was not a drop of paint on the carpet. 
but secondly, just to see the look on their faces when they came into the room, you know, there was, you know, a lot of people with special needs um, and elderly and just to see the look of joy on their face when they saw their room all painted and lovely was, that was pretty memorable, if I'm honest. Yeah, that's lovely. I remember doing something very similar to that, but around community work a few years ago where we went and um, did some glorified gardening in one of the local parks, picking up litter, sorting out all the dead bulbs, all that kind of stuff. And at the end of it, it was a, it was a full day of, of manual labour, right, which is something that we don't do in this this role that we do, right? We're sat behind a desk typing away, getting RSI yeah. rather than getting our hands dirty. And it, it was a great experience to be outside working and doing something completely different to what is, you do day to day it is good to kind of it feels good to kind of do give that little bit back you know we yeah. we invest so much into kind of doing good things for for our customers but there's actually nothing more satisfying than something that we all take for granted something that we feel is quite simple but actually means an awful lot to the people that you're doing it for and uh yeah it's always good to give back i think yeah definitely and what do you say you most you, you know the biggest mistake you made and the lesson you learned from it, what would you say that is? You know what? I think when we're young, you know, we're all a little bit hot headed, aren't we? We, we kind of, you know, we sometimes, you know, you know, emotions are at the forefront. And um, <laughs> so you remember I said I, did, I, I dibble dabbled in accountancy. You know, this is my first proper job. Well, uh, you know, it, it, it got to a Friday. It had been a really, really tough week. And I just thought, I just don't want to do this anymore. And I handed my notice in and I didn't actually have another job to go to. So, you know, not the smartest thing that I did. Um, fortunately, I was still living with my parents at the time. So I had that to fall back on. Yeah. Uh, I then spent the next four months landscape gardening while I was looking for another job, which, you know, is incredibly hard graft if you've ever done it. Um, but, you know, I think in hindsight, was it the smartest thing to do? Probably not. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think when we're first entering into, you know, our careers, sometimes emotions do run high. You know, we don't take criticism very well. Uh, you know, we're not very good at, uh, you know, at, at doing the homework. You know, we have that mentality when we come out of university that we cram read and we cram, you know, we, 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 we fill our heads with knowledge for a very short period of time. We use it, then it disappears. And I think when you're uh, working for a company, you know, they're looking to invest in you and your development. And sometimes, you know, you can take that the wrong way. And I think for me, Yes, it was a career mistake, but I think, you know, in hindsight, I probably should have had something to move on to first before I handed my notice in. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think deep down there, right, the, the underlying factor on that is that you weren't doing something that you were passionate about, ultimately. You were doing something that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put some words into your mouth here, that potentially was a well-paying potential job working in accountancy if you worked your way up, rather than necessarily something you were passionate about doing. No, it wasn't well-paid. I think that was part of the problem as well. But I think I slid into it. I, you know, I'd, I'd worked at I'd, I'd worked at a supermarket retailer uh, while I was at university, and actually, it was one of the guys that had moved on to this accountancy firm for me the job. Um, I think I did it just to get out of the supermarket, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, you know, finding something that interests and excites you, I think, is probably the most important thing that we can all learn from. Yeah, I think do something you love doing rather than just doing something for the sake of it is, is, is definitely, if you're having to get up and thinking, I really don't want to go to work today. If you're luckily, lucky enough to have the privilege to, to pivot and change and maybe challenge yourself in a different way, I think that's worth, definitely worth doing if you can. Obviously, some people are happy doing what they're doing, which is fantastic. We do need people that are happy just doing that those roles. But I think if you, if you want to challenge yourself, I think you need to think of ways of doing that safely <laughs> rather than just handing you notice in and walking out um yeah i think Carl, sometimes i don't think you can see it yourself you know you kind of you plow your you plow a certain furrow and sometimes it takes somebody else to come along and say you know what so you're really good at this if you develop you know if you maybe you put a little bit more time or you go down this path uh you know it'll be you know it'd be very valuable and i'll give you an example of uh, you know how i stepped into into pre-sales initially so working for that uh, that contact center software company, you know, I joined as an SE. You know, I was doing going out, I was doing installations, and and despite you know, I really did enjoy that. Don't get me wrong, but uh, I got invited to an expo up in Birmingham at the NEC uh, with one of our resellers, and uh, my job was to deliver the demos uh, to the customers when when they came along. But what I found was that, that, that there was more people wanting information and just having a general chit chat, and they didn't want to wait for that next 
that next session. So what I found myself doing was I went and spoke to the customers. Anyway, I had my commercial director come along and say, you know, tap me on the shoulder. What are you doing? You know, you're meant to be doing the demos. And I said, well, the next one's not for another 20 minutes yet. Like mm. you're inundated with people who want to talk. So I thought I'll go and talk to them. And he just said, you're going to scare them off. You know, you're going to, <laughs> you're going to talk techie to them. And um, I think by the end of the three days, um, you know, he sat me down and he just said, look, I think you're in the wrong career. I said, you know, he said, much as you're very, very good technically, um, you can articulate things in a way that, you know, that people understand. And he says, in my mind, that's a gift. I'm a salesman. I'm an out and out salesman. I don't understand the technology particularly well. He said, what I think you should do is I think you should move into a pre-sales role with a view maybe that you go into commercial at some point. But um, I think that was a valuable lesson for me. But I would have never have naturally have thought of that. So sometimes it does take someone in a mentor capacity to come along and say, you know what, you, that you, I see talent in this particular area and that's something that you should develop. So, and I think even now, I think that both of us probably could learn, you know, again, from, from senior execs who, are, who provide that guiding influence to us all. Yeah, those, those mentors, right? Those inspirational yeah. people that we look up to, definitely. So on um, day-to-day, what's, what's the day-to-day for Justin look like? What do you do? Uh, well, usually the alarm's going off far too early for my liking. So I'm, <laughs> I'm usually up around 6, 6.15. Um, I normally take a trip uh, to the gym at this time of year, um, normally for some form of cardio. Uh, I don't very rarely have time for a full workout. I usually save that for the evening, but usually some cardio. I then come home, um, I get my kids out of bed. I, I try and spend probably 10 minutes doing a little bit of mindfulness. I think, you know, we live in such a busy world. Sometimes you just need... Before I start the day, I just need that little bit of disconnect, you know, just to put myself into a moment. I use as an app I use called Calm. I find it brilliant. Just allows you just to kind of escape for that 10 minutes before you, you know, the full on day hits you. And invariably drop my kids off at school. Obviously, pandemic that allows me to do that. Whereas, you know, historically, I wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. Um, and then I have, then I write the list, the list for the day. Um, I have a to do list. I am religious with it. I actually have a pad which uh, I asked Citrix to produce uh, some years ago, uh, but effectively, and I can't show you it on here because it's because it's white. Um, but yeah, I usually get like my top priority stuff that I absolutely have to get done that day. And then I have the list of kind of the other things that if I have the time would be lovely to get to. Unfortunately, that list does grow and grow. And currently I'm on three pages, which isn't brilliant. But, uh, you know, the, always the aim is to try and finish ahead at the end of the day with less than I started with, which... Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a it's a nice aim to have. It doesn't always uh, work out that way, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I think one of the things that I've been learning is around prioritization, and it is that those those things that start off as a, a nice to have slowly, I say slowly in some cases, but rapidly end up becoming a priority as well. So they end up coming up the stack whether you like it or not, and end up working on oh, them absolutely. as a priority the next day or the day after. Especially in your role, you kind of need to be on top of things because you've got people on your case constantly, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely from all directions as well which that's the fun the fun of being in the reseller space from my perspective definitely so if we think about um the sacrifices that you may have made along the way do you think you've made any sacrifices absolutely i think uh i think uh, the light bulb moment happens uh for me um 14 years ago my son was born and then 15 months later, my daughter. And I think certainly when my son was born, I think I just about got the two weeks and that was hard negotiating for that. And I vowed that I would never make that same mistake with my daughter. Um, you know, I, I kind of missed out a lot of that early time with my son. And I, I regret that. That was, you know, during that very first year. But, um, you know, I, I took a little bit of a, 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 I took my foot off the gas in terms of my career deliberately because I didn't want to be the part-time dad that was just there for bedtime and, you know, playing at the weekend. You know, I, I, I deliberately, as I said, took my foot off the gas so I could have a job that allowed me that flexibility to work from home once or twice a week, you know, so that I could take them to nursery, I could take them to school. And, you know, um, unfortunately, my partner and I, we split nine years ago. So I had a three-year-old and a five-year-old and we had split custody. And I just wanted to make sure that, I, I, you know, that I was there for assemblies and sports days and parents' evenings because, you know, you only get that opportunity once. And once it's gone, it's gone. And uh, I didn't want to be filled with regret. 
So um, was it a sacrifice? I don't think necessarily I look up on it as a sacrifice, but, you know, certainly from a, it probably hurt me in the pocket a, a, a fair bit, but I yeah. think, to be honest with you, I would rather be, I'd rather be family rich and money poor in that respect. So, yeah, yeah definitely. that was, that was the approach I took. Yeah, no, and I think a lot of people have mentioned on these sessions around the sacrifices with family time and all those things to progress their career to a point where they can then comfortably take the foot off the gas without impacting the wallet to an extent um, and being able to do those kind of things. But I think that a lot of us really don't realise that until late, right? We, we, it's too late by the time you've realised it because the kids are grown up and you've missed out on all that, that, that really good exactly. time. I'm at an age now, they're 14 and 13, and I'm getting to that point where I'm starting to not be cool as much anymore. You know, they want to hang around with their friends. You know, social media has had a massive impact, uh, you know, but I think a positive impact as well um, in the fact that they can interact with their friends easily. I think, you know, gaming platforms as well um, have allowed, you know, kids to be able to play safely, especially during the pandemic, um, yeah. you know, that they can, they can join together on sessions. You know, they, they feel like they're still connected. I think, you know, people may criticise social media, um, but I think sometimes, you know, parents need to look at themselves. Um, mm. You know, social media isn't the, isn't the uh, enemy. You know, it's, it's making sure you get that quality time with them. And, and yeah, and I think, I think he's also educating them on the, the perils of social media as well as the positives of it, right? So everyone's very quick to jump on the trolling, the bullying and all those kind of things that can go on, but that happens in the real world as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's just that educational element of bringing your children up in the right way where they, they engage with people in the way that they would like to be engaged with and yeah. only give someone constructive feedback, shall we say, rather than um, a, a, an abusive comment um, when needed, because you generally wouldn't be abusive face to face. No. So why would it be fine behind the keyboard? Yeah, keyboard warriors, there's, there's plenty out there. And yes, you know, I, I do agree that there, there is a lot to answer for with trolling. Um, mm. I, I said, you know, I was, this, but, you know, to, to make sure that my kids, if, if there is a problem, they highlight it very quickly. And mm. if it stuff does get dealt with very promptly, I think schools have wised up uh, to what goes on outside of the premises, especially online. So, yeah, awesome. And moving on from that, so if we think about the, if you're looking back at yourself, um, what were the top three tips you would have given yourself as a, as a hindsight kind of idea? I think we've already spoken a little about the first thing, isn't it? It's finding some, I think in your career, I think it's important to find something that interests or excites you. You know, a career is for, you know, I wouldn't say a career is for life, but I think you can afford to make those mistakes early on. I think when you kind of get into our age, sorry, Kyle, yeah. um, you know, you know, making, making a massive career changes is a risk. But I think, you know, once you're entering, you kind of, you've got to allow yourself to take some chances um and give yourself that opportunity to to grow find an organization that wants to invest in you um you know so you've got to take that chance but the other piece of advice you know there's two, two other pieces of advice that i would give first of all is you know work on your own personal brand something that's tremendously undervalued it's taken me years to to build up a, a good following on on linkedin you know posting content that you feel is you know useful and relevant to your audience um, yeah, I work for a technology vendor, but it, I, what I can't be doing is just constantly posting stuff that's, that, that's what's in it for me. I need to be posting stuff that I think, you know what, that content's useful. I found it useful. I'm going to share it with, with the community. Yeah, but, that's, uh, that's a, me. The community thing is the big thing. It's like the, the reason why I'm doing this, this, this YouTube stuff is one, it's a bit of a hobby, a bit of fun. I also get to to learn about other people in the industry and where they've come from and things. It was like, we had a good session with Al Taylor the other night on how he got into IT from being a superstar DJ, right? And all those kind of things. And it's, <laughs> it's just a great story. And they're the kind of things, unless you get to know people in the wider community and come out of your bubble, you don't, you don't start to learn. So the, my idea on these kind of YouTube things was to, to give back ideas to people coming into the industry or even to people that are already here that are stuck in a rut. And they yeah. can maybe use some of these tips and ideas and, and how they can maybe change things for the better for themselves as well. Yeah, I think uh, there is definitely uh, a piece of guidance I would give, especially to those kind of just coming into the industry. And it's a mistake I see time and time again. First of all, you know, work on that CV. Mm. You know, have interests. 
you know, have interests that are, you know, that are relevant and socialising, by the way, isn't an interest. And I do see that on CVs. I have done in the past. Um, but, you know, build that CV up, put in your personal interest. That's the thing that sometimes can differentiate you. You know, qualifications and experience are one thing, but actually your life experience is as relevant as it's ever been. Um, and one thing I also see time and again is that individuals not doing their research on the company and the people that are interviewing them. You can get a wealth of information, you know, from LinkedIn. I mean, some, some people that are interviewed, that you're being interviewed by, you know, you can find them on social media. You can find out what their interests are. It gives you something to talk to them about, which isn't necessarily about the job. Yeah. And just remember, you know, finding a company that, that you're qualifying in is, is as important as wanting the job. You've got to want to work for that company. You know, if, if you're successful in that role, um, finding that a company that, that, that is in an area that is of interest, that is going places that you feel passionate about is, is, is important. I think on that, that social media thing again, coming back around to that, I remember seeing a post from, I think it might have been Michael Dell or maybe Pat Gelson or one of them, I can mention what it is. And they, they basically, um, when COVID hit and spring break was occurring in the US, um, they made a statement that anybody that had been captured on camera and posted on social media of going out and potentially spreading the coronavirus in, the, in that, that country wouldn't get a job in their organization moving forward, which I thought was a very bold statement because you, as we mentioned, right, when you're young, you make mistakes. Um, but again, I think, I think the impact on social media when you're being recruited to be able to see what you have and haven't done and what kind of person you are as a, as a, as a character, right? Rather than just a piece of paper that says that you're brilliant at academia. Um, I think that's where people need to be extremely careful about what they do and do not post on social media. This wasn't a thing for us, was it? Um, you know, potentially many of us are probably quite thankful that smartphones weren't around. Um, but you do have to be so careful, even now, right? Um, you know, no one wants to see you know, you know, you in a que- in a questionable position. Mm. Um, so yeah, you've got to be so careful. We, we say that it depends on who the people are, though, right? <laughs> you can always well, use that as a comedy value thing. Well, Kyle, you know how bad my golf swing is. You've seen it firsthand, so uh, yeah. that kind of thing doesn't go on social media. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not. Cool. So let's let's move on to the industry, right? So obviously, there's a lot changed since, since we started out. Um, what do you see that that the, the biggest change has been from an IT point of view? Oh, goodness. I mean, the industry has changed. I mean, the pace of change has been enormous. I mean, I don't, I certainly don't know how you, you know, you know, as that time a trusted technical advisor even manages to keep up because the pace of change is insane. Um, I think if I, if I take a look at, you know, historically, I mentioned about customers and budgets, you know, when they would come to you to say, we've got a pot of money, we need to spend it. How do we best spend it? I think those days are, are well and truly gone. I think having a good relationship with a customer is just not enough. You really need to make the effort to understand their business and not just push technology for technology's sake. You know, because I said, you know, you need to read the annual reports. You need to understand, you know, where they're going as a business, what their plans are, whether it's, you know, an M&A strategy or whether it's they, that they have, a, there's a new, in, you know, industry compliance they've got to work towards but also to consider the unconsidered stuff, the things that they're not thinking about. Um, and you need that relationship. You know, you need to build more a senior stakeholder relationship. I think if you're a partner like a CDW, uh, you know, aligning your executives, you know, with those large customers is, is so important. You know, the customer wants to feel love and it isn't just the love from the account manager that, you know, it has to, it has to kind of work its way upwards. And that's how you build relevance. That is how you become sticky. And I don't think that used to be the case. I think it was the no. fact that you and, you know, you and Bob from Acme Incorporation had a nice relationship and go out for lunch. That's not, those days are well and truly over. Especially in the current right. pandemic, right, where you can't take them for lunch really anyway. Well, um, there is that. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, I remember having this conversation with um, a graduate salesperson, um, a few, maybe about 12 months back now. Um, and they were trying to understand a bit more around the technology industry, right? They've come out of university, they've done whatever degree that they've done, and they've got a job in IT sales. Because um, generally, it's either that or recruitment that people generally fall into at the moment. Um, and the thing that they were saying is, well, I've got some good accounts, and they, they transact with me, and they, they basically send me a bill of materials, and then I transact it. And I was like, well, that's fantastic. But have you asked them what they're using it for? 
and what their plans are. If you ask for their corporate plan, if you, have, if you even looked at the website, if you looked at LinkedIn to see what jobs they're recruiting for to find out what technology they're using, if you looked at, if you asked them for their IT strategy document, because if, if they really want to work with you as a partner and you'll be able to provide value, the only way you can provide value is knowing what they're trying to achieve. And this is one of the biggest things for me that I see across, because I've worked at, what, six other resellers roughly. And the thing from my perspective is, is that knowing that customer intimately, even if it's not a personal level, but what the business is trying to achieve makes it an, an easier conversation when you're bringing in a, a, an opinion. And that's all it is as a reseller, right? You bring an opinion to the table that you can then question and debate and then hopefully show your value to then obtain some kind of monetary return, which is what resellers are there for. Absolutely. It's providing value, though. That's what you've got to do. You've got to provide value. Yeah, definitely. Okay. And obviously the pandemic's had um, positive and negative effects on various organisations. And what would you say the, the biggest positives and negatives that you've seen since this has hit? I think, well, certainly, um, first of all, you know, Citrix as a company is one that's, that's done, you know, tremendously well during, during the pandemic. And I think uh, a lot of that has come down to the fact that we've been pushing this kind of future of work for some time. And it's no longer the future of work, it's the current of work. You know, the, the ability for multiple roles to be able to work, you know, from any device anywhere, majority of it being at home, um, you know, we've been very, very fortunate, but I think it's those companies that were forward thinking that had put together those, those three to five year plans, you know, around, you know, a move, whether it would be, it would have been to hundred percent cloud or to hybrid cloud. Uh, but certainly the pandemic has accelerated that cloud adoption. And I think for some customers, I think we've seen, we've seen like three year plans delivered in a matter of weeks. That's mm -hmm. obviously put a hell of a strain on the organization, but that's where partners like, you know, the, the, the organization you work for has, has certainly benefited from, from that, but also your ability to be able to provide that really valuable consultancy, you know, that they probably only got a certain amount of budget, budget burn to go through. And, and you've got to tell them, okay, these, this is the, the logical order in which you need to go through. Um, but I think, I think the biggest losers here have, have actually been those small businesses, you know, the ones that were usually very flight of feet. They don't have the investment to make those rapid changes necessarily. And uh, I, I think certainly, you know, it's certainly the, the small retailers that have been, been really affected by this because, you know, they haven't got the money coming in to then, you know, to make those the necessary investments they need to keep going. So, you yeah. know, I feel, you know, feel very sorry for. Yeah. And I think just on that point though, right. I think for any small businesses that are out there that are struggling to, to adapt, right, and pivot to a potential new way of working. My, I'm not a business and I don't run my own business. I've never run my own business. So I, I, I'm going to say something that is maybe slightly out of turn, but my, my view on this is, is that just because you're an organization that doesn't have maybe the income stream that you need, if you, if you are looking to invest in technology to deliver a business change, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to come out of your pocket. No. So there's the likes of Intel, Microsoft, AWS, all, and even yourselves to a degree, right? Where customers can take advantage of funding to get them on that journey. And it might be in this current pandemic where you don't have that cash flow to maybe draw upon those potential funds that are available in the market to, to accelerate a change. And that's one of the things that I know that we've been doing quite a lot of in, in CDW is trying to work out where, where customers don't have the cash flow. How can we help them with payment schedules and various other things, but also where can yeah. we find funding to, to remove that completely? Um, and, and I think that's, that's as a reseller and a managed services provider that, that I work for, I think that's ultimately really key. And if you're not doing that in the reseller space today and understanding how you can reduce that cost ultimately, then, then you're going to become irrelevant at some point because you need to be able to adapt and help all the businesses you service rather than just the enterprise ones that have got a bit of money to throw around. Yeah, I know, but even with those, Kai, I mean, you've, you've got areas of technology that, that you know, organisations completely undervalue, they just don't invest in, because it's this whole concept of, you know, what's the cost of doing nothing? And I think, you know, we've, we have been, you know, as a country, you know, our government themselves have been, you know, looking for areas to cost cut, you know, we've had austerity measures put into place. And the kind of the challenge of that is, you know, as we mentioned, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the industry pace of change. And, 
I think a lot of companies are still hanging on to legacy infrastructure and it's and it's a noose around their neck, unfortunately, because you know it's their then their failure to open up, you know, to potential new markets. You know, if if companies are spending their entire IT budget just on maintenance and keeping the lights on, their ability to kind of capture that new business is, is massively compromised. And you know, and competition becomes prevalent uh, prevalent in that in that area. You know, they're the ones that are begin opening up those new markets, and uh, you know, a smaller, more agile entity can all of a sudden, you know, be a big hitter, yeah. and companies end up falling asleep at the wheel. And you know, that's the biggest challenge that I, that, that I see with a lot of companies who are in this kind of mode of, oh well, if we don't do anything, it's not cost us anything. Well, unfortunately, that's where a real awakening is uh, ready and waiting at the door. So, yeah, and I think on the point of data, right, um, I think there's a lot of organizations that capture a lot of data without even realizing it. And they just, I hope they don't just throw it into Excel spreadsheets and things, but we've seen that in the news recently. Um, but they may be storing that data somewhere and they're not really thinking about what they could do with it. How do they monetize that data? How do they create a revenue stream out of it? And that's the bit that I, I've been talking to a lot of our customers about, even at a level within the NHS, right? How can... How can you use the data you're capturing, anonymized in a lot of cases because yeah. of GDPR and various other things, but how do you then monetize that data to be able to, to get new revenue streams, new funding to make changes and all those kind of things? And I think that's one area that a lot of businesses need to sit down and take a look at and think, well, yes, I'm capturing all this information. And under things like GDPR, it says only capturing the information you need. Um, the, the, the thing there is what you need is, is kind of susceptible to, to, to whatever you think you need. At that point, you can then use it to, to monetize and to create revenue streams. And that's, I really think that with data being more valuable than gold and oil combined, organizations need to really look at their data points and think, well, this is what I can now do with it. This is what it could open a new revenue stream. This could uh, allow me to be more operationally efficient or whatever it might. It doesn't have to necessarily be stored on a file server somewhere and then left there for nine years and never consumed again. Which I think you're right. It, it's all about actionable insights, isn't it? It's in, and it's also about also about introducing a level of automation um, in there as part of it. I mean, I mean, for many companies that may sound like a utopian view, but it's the truth. You know, with the ability to be able to offer, you know, the right services at the right time, you know, to that customer or to or to that uh, consumer, uh, is of critical importance. You know, the, the the mobile industry has been you know doing this for some time. You know, isn't it funny that you get a phone call about your mobile phone contract? Uh, just at, just at the right time because they've seen you you know you're consuming more data or yeah. you know the the you know the, the tv company knowing you know can see what you're watching and consuming at home so uh you know actionable insights is something that that, that my organization have have used you know quite consistently you know and, and i try uh, have been taking customers on a, on a journey you know to move from that kind of legacy virtual app and desktop infrastructure to something that's that's more of a workplace and, and ensuring that, you know, fault finding is, is, is easy for the organization, you know, so that they can double down and, and get that problem fixed quickly. Uh, but also to be able to make changes to that environment, you know, a, a click of a switch, um, maybe even automate that process. So, um, yeah, I think certainly organizations, you know, need, as you say, need to use the data more appropriately. Um, mm. we, we certainly do do it with, with our customer insights that we receive. Um, you know, it's not just about renewals any longer. Um, you've got to be clever. You've got to be clever. You've got to retain those people. And yeah. Retain means understanding what they need and why. So on, on kind of moving on from that, is there any areas of technology that's taking your interest at the moment? Well, funny enough, it's actually being triggered from my son. Uh, I got him a PlayStation VR for Christmas uh, last year, and I found myself completely immersed by it. Um, uh, I, I think VR technology has come on absolute leaps and bounds. I think organizations are only now really just starting to see how they could use it for practical purpose. Um, I was, the interesting piece for me was actually from our ex-CTO, Christian Riley, who used to speak a lot about augmented reality. And I'm like, Christian, what the hell is that? Um, and when he kind of explained it, it was about augmenting existing environments and introducing something that's not there. Um, and, I, and I started to read up on it. I've got an active interest in kind of in, in, in the mental health side of things. And uh, I was interested to read that augmented reality is actually having a real positive impact for, you know, for PTSD patients in terms of what triggers them 
because you know the the, the clinical psychologist or the uh, it can be in that room with them and working out what those triggers are and how it impacts them you know so they'll be hooked up to kind of heart rate monitors and everything else but being able to drop th- the the ability to be able to drop things into the environment i think i think uh there's certainly a huge investment going on in that area but uh yeah i mean it's an area of technology at the moment that's cool and we're now starting to work out what the uh what the real use cases are but i certainly think within healthcare ar's got a massive part to play yeah and i know i've worked with organizations where we've used a mixture of vr ar iot and various other services to to try and do assisted living technologies and dementia care right and things along those lines so there's, there's definitely use cases for these things and I had a session the other evening, um, which will be published um, soon, that, that basically is um, a VR company who kindly sent me an Oculus device to test, and I'm going to send that back to them when I get round to it. Um, and the idea was we actually did this entire interview process in VR in a, in a virtual Mr. Tech Talk house and walking around that house, going around into different rooms, conversating, conversating on various things, but then also putting it into like a concept, right? conferences right citrix synergy vm world microsoft ignite we can't do them now right you can't go to one of these locations and have thousands of people in a room packed together with covid around it's just not ethical to do so or morally correct so i think there's an element there of well how do we bring people on online rather than just having video calls like this right so how do we use maybe vr as part of your three thousand dollar subscription to come and attend this conference you ship them out a lightweight vr headset and handset and you can walk around a virtual conference center and using 3D sound, interact with different peers and individuals and stands on the expo floor and all that kind of stuff, right? To, to really bring that to life in a part where we can't do that today. And I think there's those kind of use cases as well as teaching and training and all the various things that it, it can be really powerful from the VR point of view. I think augmented reality though is one of the things that I think should take off quicker than VR. And that's on the basis that it is ultimately a mixture of the two (laughs) and it's bringing the real world into the virtual world rather than being fully virtualized. And I think that gives a more sense of realism. Mm, Um, Sure. Still to be seen though, I think. Definitely an area of interest though. I'm going to keep tabs on that actively. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Okay. And would you say there's any like unsung heroes of technology? Um, So my example of this is like Microsoft Flow, right? You can automate a process. You can automate X, Y, and Z. You can make someone's life easier. And actually, most organizations have that license already available to them. They just don't consume the service. Is there anything along those lines that that, that you think was worth doing? Uh, I think I think on the unsung hero piece, I, I think I took a little bit of a different tact here. To be honest, I think uh, when I think of unsung heroes, I tend to think of the SE community. <laughs> if I'm honest. Yeah. In both the vendor and the partner ecosystem, you know, they are the unsung heroes because they work, you know, tirelessly to ensure solutions, you know, meet and deliver what a customer requirement is. And uh, many of them, certainly within my organization, go above and beyond. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes they don't get the credit they deserve. Um, I think from a technology standpoint, <laughs> so uh, I discovered a little tool many years ago who was on my uh, on Windows called Powermonger. It was the one app that would gave you a visual representation of what the hell was on your hard drive and i've still yet to find uh, an app on the mac that does a, a, a similar job but that that got me out of jail so many times when you're short on disk space you know they weren't um yes i get it the fact that there is a plethora of cloud options available to you now but this tool was just amazing and it was freeware which is even better so <laughs> even better free <laughs> and do you think there's any area that, of technology that organizations aren't investing in where they should do? Um, I think I did cover this slightly earlier. I think it's looking at that legacy infrastructure, you know, how much longer do you need to sweat that asset? You know, how much is it actually costing you as an organization? Um, I think, I think the other area, and I think some customers are beginning on this journey now, but I think, you know, the, the whole concept of application modernization, uh, you know, I think there's a, there's a plethora of, of tools available to, to customers now to, to almost get a blank sheet of paper and start that application build from scratch. Sometimes it's actually the best thing to do rather than trying to kind of modernize what you've already got using those you know, legacy programming platforms. 
I think we've seen, you know, the emergence of, of Docker and Kubernetes as, as viable platforms to, to, to build those applications on. I think you can spin up, you know, resource so quickly in the cloud, you know, to, to support the resources for that, for that application. And then you've got, you've got companies, you know, you know, the, the likes of, of Spinnaker as an example, where you can, you can run, you know, canary tests, um, you know, to see if the application fails and you can, you can do that almost live. Uh, you know the, the fact that now you know we there is there is so many cloud based cloud first cloud native applications out there, um, and it's enable it enables those very as I said to you sometimes the smaller more agile companies to kind of make a big statement. You only need to look at the likes of uh, Revolut and Monzo, who came out of nowhere by the way, mm. and are taking on the high street banks and beating them at their own game. Uh, I, I think you know that's phenomenal, and and the the pace in which that they can provide updates to those applications is like you've never seen. You can't do that with legacy applications. You know, it requires a complete recompile of the entire program. You're, you're going to roll it out and hit and hope. Um, and then you need a rollback plan. Then you need to meet the change window in order to do that. Yeah. I mean, you, you just take a look at these cl the, the cloud platforms alone. I mean, AWS is rolling something in the region of 4,000 changes a week uh, to, to, to the various platforms that they offer. And the speed of change, I mean, they don't even think about it. It's, it's literally instantaneous. Mm. And uh, I, I think, you know, those cloud managed platforms are obviously very much the future and taking that kind of management headache away from customers as well is, is what's really required. You know, let them focus on the application as opposed to the management of that. So, yeah, I think that's where that, that DevOps agile methodology comes in, right? Is. Waterfall project management approach where you, you're spending months and years doing something to deliver a big bang at the end rather than actually just getting a, a minimum viable product out and then iteratively making that better over days, weeks, months, and so on and so forth. And I think that's Absolutely. where it's just a I cultural think... change, right? That's the biggest challenge within IT is the cultural change and the impact on the people that have been in the industry for so long that aren't really in the right mindset for that change. Um, I think that's, that's the bigger challenge on that. I said, you know, change scares people. Even some to some of the big entities, you know, it's the uh, it's the fear of change. Unfortunately, that presents opportunities for the competition as well. So, yeah, definitely. Cool. So, final part of the uh, the the session. Um, it's going to be a quick fire round. So, lightning round. There's going to be a number of questions, right? Uh, some that I've shared with you beforehand, and some that I have not. Oh, yeah. uh, see what the answers are going to be. So I think the first one we'll start with is the last technology purchase. Mm, okay. Um, I just got myself a Rogue Echo bike with a, po with a Polar Heart monitor, um, you know, with a potential lockdown coming. The thought of not being able to go to the gym to do cardio fills me with fear. So uh, I've got myself a, a Rogue Echo bike, which uh, will probably have me on the floor in five minutes, to be honest with you, because it's really fun. <laughs> and your biggest inspiration? Sorry, this sounds really cheesy. I got asked this question a couple of years ago and was absolutely stumped on it. Um, but ironically, I think myself, to be honest, um, I think, you know, you, you, you're the greatest mechanism, you know, that you'll ever own. And I think, you know, looking after yourself, you know, providing yourself with, uh, you know, taking mindfulness, be setting goals, you should be, you know, have passions that you're excited about. And, you know, celebrating those, those small wins in, and dealing with those losses and, and learning from them. You know, I think I saw a, a comment from Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, who was head of VaynerMedia in the States. And he said, I think it was, we have a one in 13 billion chance of being alive. So I think if you kind of look at it into that context, you know, you probably should be your own inspiration and work on yourself to be the best version you can be. It does sound very cheesy, but to be honest with you, I think, you know, we don't invest enough in ourselves. Uh, we're always so busy doing other things that we forget about ourselves at the end of the day. And that's, that's unfortunately where some people fall over. Yeah, what do you want to do when you finish school? Well, you came to our summit party in Florida, didn't you, uh, Kyle? You saw me in my stormtrooper outfit. You know, like, uh, <laughs> to be honest, um, that was that was that was a bit of fun. Uh, I think it's just an excuse to get dressed up in a Star Wars costume. Uh, but I actually wanted to be a fighter pilot. I, I think I fell in love with Top Gun, the film, when it came out, and uh, you know that that excited me. You know, I thought of flying, you know, a multi-million dollar plane. Um, but unfortunately I failed my interview with the RAF twice. Um, I, I then wanted to obviously looking to become a commercial airline pilot, but just the finances required to get the, the, the air miles was just insane. And, uh, so what I did was I packed my bags and went off to university instead. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Never looked back since. Yeah, exactly. And what is your favorite book? 
The Hobbit. I think it was the first book that really kind of took me away and got me to use my imagination. You know, you were picturing exactly what the words were saying. And having watched the film, I think it was probably the first time I thought to myself, well, dear, the book is better. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fairly common, right? Books going to films isn't always the best thing. Um, mm. Most important thing to you? Uh, I think trying to be a good role model for my kids, to be quite honest. Um, you know, uh, set the bar high in that respect. But uh, yeah, that, that's something that's important to me personally. Perfect. And have you had any words of wisdom that you could put into a tweet? <laughs> you know what? At some point, we're all going to fail. You know, just take time to learn from it. You know, hashtag keep pushing forward. <laughs> hashtag. <laughs> um, favourite song? Oh, Wonderwall by Oasis. I think that gets everybody going after a drink, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and fill in the blank. The new normal is? Dreadful. <laughs> uh, must watch TV show. Oh, um, Big Bang Theory. Cool. I can get um, tired of watching that. Yeah. And favourite junk food? Five Guys. Definitely. I think, you know, that, I think Five Guys takes me back to, you know, when you were a kid and, and you got taken to McDonald's and you got like, the Happy Meal with a pencil, that was a big deal going into primary school. You know, now if you eat McDonald's, that's really not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> matter of fact you probably get slated for it but i think uh five guys just oh, wow what a burger yeah definitely i think for me the the milkshake fries on the burger which is an enormous amount of food but it's brilliant what a <laughs> perfect i think on that we're going to call it a wrap so it's great to have you on and thank you for your time mate it's been much appreciated